if I were to ask you, would you prefer swimming in Ocean A or Ocean B? You'd probably be quick to answer and say, I probably would prefer to swim in Ocean A because it looks a bit cleaner. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to talk about water quality and what water quality actually is. So we talk about the things that affect water quality. So the factors that affect water quality. Water quality. We're also going to be talking about the levels of these factors that we want to have. So the health levels, for example, sodium or um, oxygen that we need to have in rivers and lakes. And also about some tests that we can do to actually test these different levels. And that's what we're going to cover in this video. Because the reason why we, I say that is the dot point says identify. In this case, identify means recognize. So recognize that water quality can be determined by considering A, concentration of common ions, B, dissolved total dissolved solids, C, hardness, D, turbidity, E, acidity, and F, dissolved oxygen and biochemical oxygen demand, right? So I'll go for these in, for each of those. Obviously, I'll be quite brief because there's so much to cover, but it should be enough detail to cover the dot point itself because the dot point only says really identify. Right, so first, I'll talk about common ions. So obviously, these ions would be stuff like sodium and chloride, which would be quite common in the river, in the, sorry, in the ocean, not the river. We've got stuff like magnesium, calcium, there would be aluminium, phosphate. Um, these could be common to degree, but ideally in many cases they shouldn't be as common as they are. So the most common ones would be obviously be sodium and chloride. An example of levels that we want to have, or that we have at the moment in our drinking water, would be about 10 parts per million for sodium and 20 parts per million for chlorine or chloride. Uh, this is drinking water. Now, in terms of the upper limits, this is this is the limits of where it's still okay to drink or, or okay to be relatively healthy. We've got 300 parts per million for sodium and 400 parts per million for chloride. And then, for example, if you look at the ocean, that will have more than 10,000 for each of these. So 10,000 for sodium and 10,000 for chloride, which is obviously why drinking um, salt water, ocean water, is not the smartest idea. It's not very healthy. It actually causes massive problems. I don't really need to remember these numbers, but you should remember that you know having different levels of these ions could cause problems, right? So if we have too much sodium or too much chloride in our drinking water, that will cause death more or less, right? So we need to keep them under control. So when we have ways that we keep them under control. And magnesium and calcium are two more that I mentioned, but there's probably another five, six that are quite common. But the idea is just that for you to know, we need to check these ions to make sure they're in these tolerable limits to make sure that we can actually have safe drinking water and safe um, swimming water. And the way we do that is for these tests that we can do. So for example, to check for sodium, we can use atomic absorption spectroscopy. I won't go over the whole principle again because I covered it in a couple of years back. But the idea would be just to have your sample here. You use a light that detects sodium and you see, and then you get a reading and then you can figure out how much sodium is in there. Or for chloride, you could use gravimetric analysis. And that's just the idea that you do basically you evaporate a sample and then you measure out the chloride and you can see how much it has using uh, the composition of it. Right? So those would be two ways that you could measure ion concentrations. So in terms of the next one, it would be TDS or total dissolved solids. What they are is they are usually most ions. They're basically dissolved solids within a water sample. So if you have a water sample here, there might be some dissolved solids inside of it. And those will be mostly ions. So when we talk about dissolved solids, we usually talk about ions that might be inside of the actual water. And again, you can imagine if, if for example, most, most of the water is dissolved ions, that might not be super healthy. So we try to keep dissolved solids to a limit. And that's usually about 40 to 100 parts per million. And that's, that would be healthy drinking water, right? If it gets to more than 500 parts per million, it can become un unhealthy. And sometimes, for example, um, when you're looking at seawater, 1,000 liters, sorry, 1,000 milliliters of seawater can have up to 30 grams. So that would be equivalent to about 30 mils of dissolved solids. So that means, obviously, just think seawater is the opposite of what we should be doing because grams or milliliters is not close to parts per million. So we try to remove most of these parts per million, most of these dissolved solids, to make sure we have a healthy drinking water. And one way we can do that is using the conductive probe. And the reason why we can use this conductive 
probe or meter is because dissolved solids are usually ions, and ions are usually charged, right? So you can see chlorine would be negative charged and sodium would be positively charged. And that means if we send electricity through it, um, or if we, if we attach a circuit, right, current will flow because these sodium and chlorine and different ions will make the current flow through the actual whole uh, system, which means the more current flows through it, the more dissolved solids there are. So we can use a conductive probe meter or conductive meter to test how many dissolved solids are in a sample because most of these are ions and most of these will conduct electricity, which means the more electricity and the more dissolved solids. This would be a test for TDS or total dissolved solids. Next, we're going to talk about hardness. And when we're talking about hardness, we're talking about usually levels of calcium and magnesium inside water because too much calcium or too much magnesium will make the water hard. And what we mean by hard, it's often tastes different, right? It has a very um, strange taste, a very hard taste. It doesn't taste like normal drinking water. And we want to make sure obviously those levels are not too high. In terms of the ID levels, for soft water, so soft water is what we want to have. That's not hard water, it's the opposite of hard. That's about less than 60, so this means less less than 60 parts per million would be soft. So less than 60 parts per million of calcium and magnesium. Whereas between 120 and 180 parts per million would be hard, so this is what we're trying to avoid. Now, we can test it two different ways. We can have a soap test or we can have the EDTA titration test. And one is a qualitative, the other is a quantitative. Remember, qualitative means that we just look at it. We don't have numbers. We just look at it and we can see it from the looking at it. Whereas quantitative means we have, actually have numbers to back this up. So the first one I'll describe would be the soap test. That's a qualitative one. That means we have, we're just looking at if there's something inside or not. And that's, for example, because hard water will, if we add soap to hard water, the soap will lather in hard water and in soft water it will froth. So what I mean by this is you can see this diagram here. We've got water and we've put soap into it and it's produced these bubbles. What I mean by bubbles is it's froth. So this would be soft water because these bubbles have been produced. And if we do the same thing with hard water, you will not have much bubbles because you'll have scum instead. And this would be the lathing or lather. So this means that there is too much too much magnesium or too much calcium in the actual sample. And the chemistry of this, you don't need to know the chemistry of it. The chemistry of it would just be that, for example, if we have a calcium ion and we have a soap uh, molecule, soap ion, right? So it's soap ion, not molecule. And um, if those two come together, they actually form a compound. And this will form this one. This is the compound. And this will basically be the scum, right? So once calcium and the soap particle combine, it can no longer froth as it would usually do, and the scum is produced instead. So the more calcium we have, the more they will combine the soap, and the more scum will be produced. And that's a qualitative test. It's just, that's just looking at it. We don't have these numbers to back it up. But then we can also do the EDTA titration, and I'm not going to go over the sort of details of it. But the idea would be just that if we have, for example, calcium or magnesium, which would be this part here, this would be a metal ion. They would form a one-to-one -one relationship. They would combine with EDTA, which is just a different type of ion, in a titration, and that will form MEDTA, right? But the idea is basically it's a one-to-one -one ratio, which means the more of this EDTA disappears, the more of the actual calcium we have. And we can measure it directly because it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Right? So we know how much we had to begin with from this, and the more of this will disappear, the more of the actual calcium and magnesium we had. And that's how we can figure out those exact numbers. But those were just two tests for hardness. Now, turbidity, turbidity, the actual measuring unit is nephelometric turbidity units. Uh, what turbidity is, is a measure of the suspended particles. Remember, that's basically not dissolved. So suspended particles means they're still solid, but they're just floating around in the actual water. So that's different from dissolved. So turbidity is the measure of the suspended particles, and it's measured as nephelometric turbidity units, or NTU. Now, in terms of what's acceptable, um, one to three NTUs is acceptable. Much of our drinking water might actually be lower than that as well, but that's still okay. But if we go, for example, above 25 NTU, that's where death occurs, right? So it, it is important that we have it relatively low because the more it goes, the more higher it goes, the more problems we have. Now, our qualitative one, sorry, our quantitative one, so this is the quantity, the quantitative test, where we actually get the numbers, would be gravimetric analysis. Again, the same idea, we have a sample, 
we evaporate that sample and then all of a sudden we can have left over a bit of stuff and that stuff would be our suspended particles mostly right so that could be the quantitative test now the qualitative test this is just the observing it without having the numbers would be using a for example um, a sechi disk and what happens here because the more NTU we have remember NTUs are the suspended particles so the more NTU we have the more cloudy the water will be right so the, because these suspended particles will just make make this cloudy the cloudy appearance mean that water that light won't be able to travel as far down and that means we can use this disk the disk is just has a long handle and it has just a disk at the end we put it into water and the further we can see we can again it has a very long kind of handle so the further we can put it down and we can still see the disk the less to be there is so in this one example this can go very far down and we can still see it whereas here the, it becomes cloudy and, and becomes kind of non-seeable which means there's probably lots of uh, suspended particles which are blocking the way that we, so we can't see it anymore so we know we have high suspended particle or a high turbidity in that water and the problem with turbidity especially when it comes to aquatic life marine life if there are fish down here and there's high turbidity that means the, all of the light will be absorbed before it gets there that means these fish or these plants not fish the plants will not have any light for photosynthesis right so the more turbidity the less light gets past the actual ocean to the bottom or it's more down deeper into the ocean then we've got also dissolved oxygen now what dissolved oxygen is the name is self suggested it's just dissolved oxygen so how much percentage of oxygen is inside water percentage of oxygen in water now if you've got or in this case we're actually not measuring percentage we're measuring in parts per million so for example if we have less than parts per million five parts per million then we have a problem right so we need to have more so more than five parts per million for it to be healthy less than five parts per million is where problems start but if we have less than one part per million we actually have most of the aquatic marine life being dead it dies from having very low levels that makes sense because obviously marine life fish and everything else they require oxygen just like we do so the less oxygen there is in water more problems they'll have. So this talks about dissolved parts per million of oxygen. Five parts per million or less is problematic. One part per million or less is deadly for organisms. So we want to make sure that in our water is usually more than five parts per million. So between five and eight is, is quite quite good. Um, the way we can measure it is using a polarographic oxygen probe. Right? Polarographic oxygen probe. And how this works is we've got the circuit, a circuit here. The circuit's incomplete which means no electricity flows but it becomes complete when we have oxygen so oxygen will actually complete the circuit right? it will make sure that the whole electricity can flow and the more oxygen we have the more a circuit will be complete so what that means is the more oxygen we have the more current will flow and that means we can use the measure of the current to determine how much oxygen we have in any given area so the holographic oxygen probe allows us to measure uh, the actual oxygen levels directly because the current, the amount of current will be directly proportional to the amount of oxygen. Now there's a couple of things that can actually affect the amount of oxygen in a, a water body and that would be contact with atmospheric oxygen. Obviously the further it is away from, from the atmospheric oxygen the less exchange there will be. Uh, we've got temperature, the higher the temperature the more uh, oxygen does not dissolve so the more oxygen leaves so high temperature is bad for dissolved oxygen solid concentrations and pollution and pollution is what we're going to talk about now because, because for example sewage is often pollution of bacteria or other organisms and that will actually eat up some of the oxygen so the more sewage we have in water the less oxygen as well so these are some of the factors that can affect oxygen but remember we want to have dissolved oxygen to make sure organisms can survive and, and live like, like they usually do now what I want to talk about is the BOD or the biochemical oxygen demand now here we have to take the initial DO, so initial dis dissolved oxygen, and take that sample. So we take a sample, we measure the initial DO using the polarographic oxygen probe or any other measurement. Then we store it for five days at 20 degrees Celsius. The reason why we have 20 degrees Celsius is because if we have high temperatures, remember that affects the concentration, so we want to make sure we keep it at a relatively room temperature-like temperature. So we take it, the sample, measure the DO, then store it for five days and measure it again. And what is the BOD or the biochemical oxygen demand? It's the initial 
DO, so the initial temperature, as uh, initial, sorry, dissolved oxygen, minus the, the dissolved oxygen after five days. So for example, let's say we have, let's say we have eight parts per million initially, then afterwards we have four parts per million uh, after five days, so then our BOD would be eight minus four, and that would be four. So then we know, would know that four parts per million have left after five days, they have been consumed, right? So this, these four are gone. That's the difference between initial and after. And that means that these bacteria, because what usually happens is bacteria and other organisms that would require oxygen, they would be the ones who would be using that up mostly, right? So for example, if you have a water sample, there's no fish or anything else in there, and water and oxygen just drops all of a sudden, that would usually mean that there's some organism that's in there that would have consumed that oxygen. And, and it usually means pollution, so especially sewage, because in sewage, you've got these bacteria inside, which will eat up the oxygen, and that's bad because if that is in, a, for example, the ocean or river, river water, that means that there's less oxygen for fish. So we want to make sure that the difference, uh, the, the jump in parts per million after five days is pretty low. So if it's high, that means we're going to have problems when it comes to dissolved oxygen for the future. And so that was BOD, bi biochemical oxygen demand. So biochemical oxygen demand just measures how much oxygen is consumed in a five-day period. And the higher the BOD, the worse it is for any aquatic life that lives in that water. The last thing we're going to talk about is pH. And it's a pretty straightforward one. Um, we want to make sure we have a pH between 6.5 and 8.5, depending on the actual rivers. So rivers would have more in the 7-ish category. Seawater is a bit higher. It's, it's going to have a pH around about 8-ish. But basically, we want to keep in that range. And uh, what pH is, is a measure of hydrogen concentration. That's just what pH is. And remember, 7 is neutral, um, and that's usually at river water. 8-ish is what it's, what it's going to be for most um, oceans, and that's because of some of those dissolved, dissolved ions. But we want to keep it roughly in that category. So a pH of less than 4 would be death for most aquatic organisms. So marine organisms would die... Um, not all of them, but a lot of them will die from these lower levels. And one of the causes of the, this really low pH could be acid rain, right, acidic rain. If we have a pH of above 9, that's also really problematic. And that could come from industrial discharge, such as ammonia. Discharge. Ammonia is very basic. And if you put ammonia into oceans or rivers, that could change the pH as well. And that could also lead to death for organisms. So either a too low or too high pH could affect the death uh, could affect the organisms, it could kill them, and it could also have other effects. So basically, for the stop point, um, you need to know for each of these, A, B, C, D, E, F, you should know, first of all, um, what it actually is. So what is it? What is it? Are we testing here? Safe levels would be good for you to know as well. Safe and unsafe. And a test. When it comes to test, you do not need to know the chemistry, so the chemistry you don't need to know for the stop point, but it'd be good for you just to be able to say, okay, we can use this to test this, right, because the stop point only says identify, but you should know these three things, because it could be a, a question which does ask you a bit of this, right, so what are we testing, what are the safe levels and what are the unsafe levels, and what test could we use, but hopefully that was useful.